Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is the environmentalist Jonathan Porritt, who is the founding director of Forum for the Future, the UK's leading sustainable development charity. He's the former chair of the Green Party and former director of Friends of the Earth. He's going to talk to us today about his latest book, The World We Made, Alex Mackay's story from 2050, and the prospects for people engaging with the issue of climate change in general. Hello, Jonathan. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Hello, nice to talk to you. Okay, could you begin by giving us a, a bit of an overview of the book, Jonathan? Sure. Um, well, I've been involved in this world of sustainability for more than 40 years now, and um, to be honest, I'm, I suppose, inevitably a little bit disappointed by how hard it's been to make the case for living more sustainably on planet Earth. Yeah. And have come to the conclusion that partly because people are very reluctant to confront some of the implications of uh, needing to live more sustainably, but also because, in a way, we often tend to talk about the dark side of this, the really bad things that are happening, the gloomy impact on planet and people, uh, loss of the world's forests, accelerating climate change, some of the big poverty and social justice issues. So it's not a very, <laughs> it's not a very appetizing agenda for people to kind of get themselves absorbed in. So what I did with The World We Made was to turn that on its head, write the book from 2050, looking back at how it was that we actually succeeded in creating this really good, genuinely sustainable and socially fair way of life for people in 2050. And that was the whole thrust of it. Change the mood music, as I said, make the thing sound really exciting and upbeat and then people might see that sustainability is really something that works in their interests rather than in the interests of the environment movement or whatever it might be. Now your main character is a, is a teacher to what, what degree did you draw on your own experience as a, as a comprehensive school teacher in the 1970s? Well it was useful to have that um, I hugely enjoyed my 10 years teaching um, in the 70s and early 80s, um, and in many respects that 10 years in the state system in comprehensives in both East London and uh, uh, West London kind of gave me a very solid grounding about what the world needs to, to achieve and how we need to do this in a way that is much more socially just and equitable and put in place very firm foundations for a better approach towards the environment. So I drew on that experience a little bit, but to be honest, Alex is uh, obviously a, a, a fictional work, so Alex isn't um, me, as it were, <laughs> Alex, is a genuine, genuinely fictional creation. Okay, and uh, and you also make the point, uh, you stress the point that it's it's not a really a prediction of the future that will happen. Rather, it's it's more of a blueprint that you know that we could aspire to. And you, you also, as you said in the, in your introduction, you, you use a sort of narrative technique called backcasting. Could you could you explain the, the rationale behind that? Yes, and I think that's really important because I don't, you know, I no more know what the world's going to look like in 2050 than you do or any of your listeners do. It's, you know, there's only so much that you can genuinely anticipate about the, the future of the world in 35 years' time. So what I wanted to do was to present a vision of yeah. a better world, not the vision, but one possible scenario or outcome that would be available to us if we began to apply ourselves really intelligently to these big um, problems that we face. And the technique of backcasting is really helpful in that regard because what it means is that you look at the kind of world that you'd want to be living in, in a, at a given point in the future, from a sustainability point of view, from a social point of view, from education and health and all the rest of it. And you look at what that world could be and then instead of um, sort of seeing that as a distant, hopeless, utopia, you use that to track out the steps that we need to take between where we are now in 2015 and what it would mean to get to that kind of world in 2015. So it's backcasting rather than forecasting, as it were, which often and takes you into a place that looks very similar to today, but not much better. Um, you also make it very clear in the book that the world in 2050 is not perfect, but, but, you know, but nevertheless, real incremental change 
towards sustainability has occurred. And for me, it didn't come across as some utopian fantasy or alternatively that we, you know, that we have to become Luddites. Uh, we, we, with regard to this, I, I really recently interviewed Adam Corner, who, um, who is the research director of the, the Climate Outreach and Information Network, COIN. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I am indeed, yes. yeah. He, he suggests that to make engagement with, with climate change more psychologically palatable, it's important to strike a balance, as, as you said earlier, again, between this sort of catastrophizing and bright side in and, and then and also importantly that it's something people need to relate to their own experience now you seem you obviously seem to be employing such an approach in the book so so to what degree do do you think we need to take psychological factors into account when when framing the debate around climate change i think they're enormously important um I, you see i don't think people are in denial as people often say about climate change um, apart from a minority, let's be honest, there are some politically motivated uh, people who see the challenge of climate change as bringing an end to their particular model of capitalism. So they're always going to be um, in in strategic denial yeah. because of that reason. But for most people, they kind of know it's happening and they're not ignoring it and they're not denying it. But what they can't see is what part they can play in doing anything about it. And they're uncertain as to how quickly it's going to impact on people's lives and whether it really is going to take us to the edge of the abyss to this apocalyptic future that you're talking about. Yeah. So the psychology of change becomes absolutely fundamental because if you go on urging people that they absolutely have to get involved, that they should feel guilty about unsustainable aspects of their lifestyle now, and that if they don't respond to that challenge, then we're all heading to hell in a handcart. Well, it's not really too surprising if people kind of say, well, that's your point of view, but I don't see it like that, and I'm not sure how I can really make a difference anyway. Yeah. So we have to present the upside realistically, not in any kind of nirvana-like uh, fashion. It has to be very concrete. It has to be geared towards the things that make a real difference in people's lives, such as access to good work, employment opportunities, ways in which skills are increased, improvements in people's lives, um, addressing issues like fuel poverty. Here in the UK, for instance, doing something about climate change means getting rid of fuel poverty in the UK. More efficient systems, better transport, better ways of producing the food that we need. It basically has to be all the things that really matter to people about their lives. And trying to get them to see that if we can address climate change in the right kind of way, it's just a win-win-win across the board. Yeah, and I, I suppose to an extent it's, it's trying to uh, engage with people's values. Yes, I think that's important. I think, you know, we live in a rather harsh and cruel world in many respects, and I sometimes think the way the, more, the media portray our lives here in the UK in particular, but also in the USA, leaves out so much of that deep caring and concern that goes on across the whole of society. I mean, for instance, I'm astonished that we know that the backbone of society in the UK is made up of millions, tens of millions of people volunteering their time and effort and love um, to make life work better for other people, people in need or voluntary clubs or organizations or whatever it might be. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing. No country in the world has this. It's just this incredible outpouring of commitment and love that we see through voluntary organizations and uh, of one kind or another. Now, you don't really see that reflected very much in the way we talk about life here in Britain, in the UK at the moment. Yet it's a central underpinning characteristic of the UK economy. and It's based on deep, caring, compassionate values for other people. And if we don't celebrate that and say it's this, this kind of source of, of compassion, decency, integrity that we need to draw on as we navigate our way through to a low-carbon world, if we don't call on that, we're just ignoring what is an absolutely critical part of the of people's personal values and what it is that makes a country like the UK really great. Yeah. Why, why do you think we don't see it reflected? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I end up with a, in conversations of this kind, often kind of launching another attack on the media here in this country because I do think that the mainstream media have a, a sort of systematic intent to cut people down rather than build them up, to disparage, to belittle, to 
make fun of, to caricature, to destroy the reputations of people. There's something vicious and nasty about much of what happens in the name of mainstream media here, and, and uh, I think it creates an awful, an awful tone about the way we look at ourselves. Sure. Yeah. Well, if we've got time, we might just touch on that a bit later. But, but can we just maybe unpack a bit of some of the ideas in the book? One of the, way, the ways you structured the book was that it was is in the form of a school project, and each week, Alex uh, and his students, you know, tackled a a, um, a new issue. Now, um, there are obviously too many ideas in the book to ex explore them all in this conversation, but but maybe we could just unpack unpack a few of them for, yeah. example, uh, for example the enough movement what is that and and do you see the seeds of such a movement today one of the things that i'm pretty astonished by is the fact that young people aren't more angry about our dereliction of duty on their behalf i, I think every generation has a responsibility both to itself to, to make things work as well as we can for ourselves but equally for future generations and yet what we're doing on uh, approach to climate change and protection of the natural world, looking after resources, all of these kind of things. Uh, it, this is going to cause terrible damage to young people's prospects. And if you look at the evidence base now, we kind of know that. It's not, it's not really disputed by, by any scientists. It's, it's taken as a given that that's the consequence of continuing to improve our fortunes today, essentially by stealing from people tomorrow. So the Enough movement was a, a sort of projection on my part to say that there will come a moment when young people will rise up, probably in the first instance via social media rather than physically on the streets, will rise up and say that is enough, this is ridiculous, we've got all the science we, we need to tell us that we need to live differently and more responsibly in terms of the planet, and we've got all the technologies we need to do that so what is the problem we, there's no lack of technology and there's no lack of money but what is getting in the way is the lack of political will to make it possible for people to improve their lives today whilst ensuring that young people have access to the same entitlements tomorrow. That's, that's what sustainable development is all about. Now, my hunch is this is going to happen. Because if we continue with a business as usual model of prosperity and growth at all costs and so on, theirs is going to be a, a broken and difficult world for them to prosper in. And at some point, I think young people are going to rise up and they're just going to say this is this is not right this is immoral you're betraying your responsibilities to us as the next generation and we need to address this now not at some distant point in the future when you think you might eventually get round to it uh, well, one of the things that have just made me think there you know you're saying that the the scientific evidence is is overwhelming i mean you know they say something like 97 percent of the scientific community are behind the idea that, that of human-made climate change, but that three percent, some people say, well, like, we, it's not 100 percent, so then it, it can't be proven. And how do we get around this idea that 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 people can accept it's beyond reasonable doubt? Yeah, well, if you if the um, level of evidence that you're looking for is 100 percent, um, then there would be very few reasons to do anything of the things that we do in life because we don't often get 100% certainty about things. We don't. We really don't. We yeah. really don't. I mean, for instance, we know that it's not 100% certain that when we get in a car and drive around the place that we're, we're not going to have an accident. There's a sort of low risk that we might have an accident. And what do we do about it? We take out insurance. We yeah. protect ourselves against that, happily, a quite low risk of an accident to ourselves in going about our daily business. It's a low risk that your house will be broken into and things will be stolen, relatively low risk, but we insure against it. And essentially, we do that way, way before it gets to 100% certainty that this is going to happen. Yeah. Now, it's the same with climate change. In essence, if you look at what we need to do around climate change, it is an insurance policy against the worst possible eventuality, which is that we cannot stop the, the kind of forward momentum of, of acceleration in, in climate change. And the changes get more and more severe, the disruptions get more and more extreme, the cost to society gets greater and greater. So nobody should look for 100%. And yeah. scientists who demand 100%, to be honest, are just playing a game. It's just a wretched and in my opinion unethical game to try and 
deter politicians from doing what pretty much everybody now knows we should be doing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there, but, it, but it's not just scientists that say that. For example, you know, in like in the United States, especially, it's religion that says, well, you know, it's not 100 percent. But what I found really interesting and exciting potentially in the book is that you suggest that religions could play a huge part in the creation of a more sustainable world. Could you expand on that? And could, or could for example, the recent appeals with regard to environmental sustainability by the Pope, for example, and the Dalai Lama last week at Glastonbury be a sign mm -hmm. potentially of things to come? Yes, I think these are really important parts of what's going on in, in the world today regarding the environment and climate and so on. And we're a little bit um, peculiar here in the UK because this is one of the most secular countries in the world, if not the most secular according to some statistics. And we forget that out of a global population of around 7.3 billion people, at least 6 billion of those, and probably more, base their life on some kind of set of religious or spiritual um, tenets, belief systems, whatever it might be. Ours is still a predominantly faith-based world. I'm sorry, Richard Dawkins, you're not going to like that, but yeah. the numbers, since you're after empirical evidence, the numbers tell you that that is the case. So, of course, it's crucial that those religions and faith systems, spiritual practices, that they are part and parcel of this rising up and doing a better job to help protect uh, the, the earth, to help protect the resources that we depend on to stop things like climate change. And for me, that was going to be a big part of the book because I'm absolutely certain that that is already happening. And you mentioned the encyclical from the Pope uh, recently, which of course was hugely impactful. Um, I think that the Vatican must be absolutely astonished at <laughs> such a high level of interest from around the world and from many non-Catholics, um, 1.3 billion Catholics, but there was lots of non-Catholics who really applied themselves to this and tried to understand it better. I'm just a bit cross because I did actually um, forecast this in the book that the Pope would take a leading part in addressing these issues, <laughs> but it wasn't really meant to happen until 2017. He's gone two years early, and this is really... It's very irritating when you make these projections. Not on, is it? <laughs> I'm joking. I really celebrate. I love the fact that we've got significant world leaders now. Whatever you may feel about about the Pope and Catholicism or Buddhism and the Dalai Lama, it's so important to have that quality of leadership out there now. And just back to the, this, what we were talking earlier about framing. Um, I mean, I've, I've read research that says, like in the United States with conservatives, you know, like conservatives do care about the environment, but often it's just about language. So you, you talk about the land rather than sustainability, or you talk about swamps rather than wetlands. Yes, I, it's funny. I think the language does often take people into a place where they divide on these things rather than come together on these things. A huge swathe of people in America, so-called conservatives, are passionate about the natural world, about the environment. They really do care about it. There's no reason why a conservative-minded person would care any less about the environment than someone who's passionate about social justice. Sure, yeah. it's, it's as important to every part of the political spectrum. But sometimes the language, the messaging goes wrong. It, does, doesn't, it doesn't appear as if it's their kind of agenda. And that means very often that things spin off into a, a lot of political divergence and sometimes polarization, which makes it harder to bring people together around a shared sense of common purpose. You, you also hint in the book that it might need a series of or combination of, of huge environmental disasters to occur to really shake people out of, of you know, to, to use another word, indifference. Are there examples from, from history that could indicate this? <laughs> well, um, sadly, yes. Um, the, the, the history tells us that if we look back over the history of um, civilizations that have gone before us, uh, whether you're talking about civilizations in the Middle East, Mesopotamia, you're talking about civilizations in North America, um, all around the world, that neglect of critical resource and environmental factors often precipitates their own decline and disappearance. Um, and there's an astonishing book written about that called Collapse by Jared Diamond, which is a, which is a wonderful yep. text on how badly humankind has managed some of these things in the past. Now, we have a lot more knowledge now. I mean, we are so well equipped in terms of knowledge to avoid that kind of uh, eventuality.
sensuality that we really shouldn't be getting it wrong again. But the truth is, we know that humankind responds to crisis, to disaster, to things that go wrong, as well as to the things that go right. And I think it's inevitable now that we're going to see a, a number of these shocks to the system, as I describe them, both in terms of climate and food security uh, issues of that kind, which will be horribly painful, but may, just in time, persuade people to commit to these quite big transformative changes that we now need. But it is a, it's a, I'm not saying it's a minor part of the book, but in terms of the balance of the book, um, I agreed with our publishers, with Fiden, that out of the 50 little sort of chapters that we've got there, that no more than eight of those would be about shocks to the system, and all the rest would be about the solutions, which is what I tried to focus on. Yeah, well, no, really, I think you got that balance <laughs> right there, Jonathan. You also stress in the book that education is key. Um, what, what do we need to do there that, you know, that we're not doing now? I'm absolutely convinced about that. It's, um, you know, for young people now to leave school or if they're going on to college or university, they need to come out into the world understanding the nature of this challenge, understanding the part that they can play in addressing that challenge, um, being well informed about big issues like climate change so they don't get misled by people wherever it might be through the media or politics. This level of understanding, the grounding in the state of our world today is absolutely critical. We need active citizens to help pull us round into a better place than we're in at the moment, and you don't get act active citizens without really good education. And, you know, I'm still absolutely dedicated to the whole concept of good education here in the UK. I'm still passionate about the importance of teaching and helping teachers help young people fulfill their potential. I didn't actually intend really to get into the whole world of environment when I went off to Friends of Earth in 1984. I thought I'd go back into teaching. Um, and these days I am still involved in teaching. I'm, I'm Chancellor of the University here in the UK called Keele, and I'm very involved now in higher education issues and sustainability. So it, for me, is absolutely fundamental. It's the bedrock on which we can bring about a generational change in the future. Okay, and then briefly, what do you think some of the other big game changers could be? For, for example, you suggest that much of the knowledge and technologies are already out there. For example, you suggest that solar power and the internet could play massive roles. Yes, I, this is one of the most exciting things going on in the world today, and it is actually breathtaking the speed of change. Um, if you look at those, the combination of these technologies, renewable energy technologies, um, of which solar power is obviously one, combined with much smarter ways of managing and using energy, so energy efficiency at the heart of it, some of the new technologies on storage and smart grids and so on. This is a complete transformation of the energy system on which we depend, and I mean complete. It, it, in 20 years' time, we will look back on how we get and use our energy today as the most primitive story imaginable. And the speed, that it's going to happen that quickly. And you can see that because that's where the money is going now in the USA, in China, in India, here in Europe. People are beginning to see this alternative, renewables, efficiency, storage, smart grids. That's what the alternative adds up to, better transport systems, electric vehicles, and so on. They're beginning to see that as the place where big investments will now be made. And the speed of change will be dramatic, so dramatic that I think a lot of people are going to get caught out um, you've got pretty much all the big investment banks saying now that solar power, for instance, will compete with regular sources of energy on a subsidy-free basis. So <laughs> no subsidy. George Osborne doesn't have to worry his little head about all that stuff on a subsidy-free basis by 2020. Five years. I mean, this is, this is a revolution unfolding in our lives today. Yeah, yeah. Just continuing this theme, a lot of the book, though, is it... Uh, is about innovating our way out of climate change. And in the book, you, you stress that you do see that potentially capitalism could survive in a, in a maybe a more empathic form. But if we look at our track record with capitalism, it, it, you know, it does indeed make great efficiencies. For example, cars are, you know, incredibly more efficient than they, they were, say, 30 years ago. But these efficiencies are being, at the moment at least, vastly outpaced by the sheer scale of economic growth. Shouldn't we be tackling consumerism and, and inequity as the main forces against the environment? Or does the main theme of the book, 
empathy enabled by technology again suggests we try to find a balance here well hmm that's interesting i mean i'm not at all complacent about um capitalism the book that i wrote before this one was called capitalism as if the world matters and was all about what we need to do to transform capitalism yeah um rather than simply continue with the model of capitalism that we have at the moment and I'm, I'm pretty clear about that just from a pragmatic point of view. I mean, either we do what we need to do through what is predominantly a market-based, profit-based capitalist system, or we have to change that system. And if you look at the likelihood of us changing the system to come up with a completely new ideology to create a sustainable fair world for 9 billion people by 2050, sorry, that isn't going to happen. Just look at what's going on in Greece, one tiny little sliver where a country that desperately wanted to change the cruel nature of a, a capitalist uh, system as it impacted on them, it's finding it impossible even to come up with a small-scale set of changes inside the system. So we're not going to get rid of capitalism. I'm sorry, I know there'll be some people who are really upset about that. They, they probably shouldn't be because capitalism as a social construct can actually work well for people. It's not necessarily the, the... It shouldn't be represented by the truly awful things that it's responsible for in the world today. So I wanted to put in place a kind of set of changes that made capitalism work for people rather than make us all work for capitalism and the elite that dominate today's version of capitalism, the 1% of the 1%, and use markets more intelligently, use price signals more intelligently, use the profit motive more intelligently, use the drive for uh, productivity and resource efficiency more intelligently. Just make capitalism smart, to be honest. Now, that's still incredibly difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not stressing that's an easy story, but it's marginally easier than overthrowing capitalism and putting something in in its place. In the latest UK election, um, climate change, though, oh, this is just from my perspective, but climate change and unsustainable growth didn't seem to hardly get a mention. Um, would, do, what, would you agree with that? Or if, if that's the case, what would you put that down to? No, I agree with you. It was, um, it was really awful, to be honest. Um, and the Green Party tried, Natalie Bennett, during the leaders' debates, tried to introduce climate change rapidly, pushed aside by the, um, the moderator and by everybody else, of course, in those debates. Yeah. Um, media didn't want to know about it, political parties didn't want to know about it, they stitched it all up in advance, incidentally, the three big parties, Labour, Lib Dems and the Conservatives, by coming to an agreement six weeks before the election that they would all agree to honour the commitments under the Climate Change Act, and everybody thought, well, that's really encouraging, good, we've got consensus here in the UK, which, by the way, doesn't exist in in any other country in the world, yeah. uh, in statute, as it were, in law. We thought that was terrific, but of course what it meant is they thought, well, we don't have to mention this again. So none of them, absolutely no mention of climate change at all. It was no. shocking. disgraceful, to be honest. Just back to what we were talking about before, you know, the, ro the role of the media in getting people appropriately informed just seems critical. However, what do you think we can, what can we do there? Because there seem to be such powerful vested interests involved. Yes, that is indisputably true. And you can see how big an impact it can make when The Guardian decided that it would get behind this um, campaign. Keep it in the ground. Leave it in the ground, to leave coal in particular unmined, un, uh, unexploited, and to help protect the climate through that mechanism. It's made a huge difference. It's ramped up the level of visibility, and people are now focused on that. Uh, and you may say, well, that's The Guardian. Does that count for anything? It does count. All our mainstream... Uh, broadcast and um, newspapers are big contributors to the overall tone and the mood of of media visibility in our lives today. Um, about time The Guardian did it, by the way. They did it around for about a decade without <laughs> really getting stuck in, so I'm not going to give them too much praise on that score. Um, but you can see how big an impact stuff like that makes, and you can see how the drip, drip, drip of kind of, uh, of um, doubt and contrarian beliefs in the times and the Telegraph and the Daily Mail and all of these places just wear away people's sense of the absolute imperative of doing this stuff. So we have to address that. Happily, of course, young people, most young people today think all that approach to the media is pretty much irrelevant. None of them really read 
mainstream newspapers, a lot of them don't even watch mainstream television any longer. Their media insights come through completely different channels and are organized in completely different ways. So we shouldn't give up on this. We, we've lived through an age where the media played a, a dominant role through established institutions almost. That's just not the story today. And do you think internet ways of people accessing things, like I'm thinking like avaz.org, do, do you think yeah. they could pr play a role? Yeah, no, I mean, I've watched the, the growth of Avaz and here in the UK of 38 Degrees um, and change.org. You know, these are, people can get very cynical about these things and they can say, oh, well, it's just click to this, you know, they don't actually ever do anything, all they do is click a button. Well, it's simply not true. I mean, these are these are mobilizing campaigns that touch people very directly and I would urge everybody to not only get involved uh, politically and through campaigning and activist organizations in their own community, but also to be part of this broad global movement because it's exciting and, and things happen. You know, the recent decision from Lancashire County Council not to approve the, the new big fracking development. I'm not saying that that campaign was won by social media campaigns, but I tell you what, it certainly had an impact. Yeah, well, I, I'm part of this green surge, uh, Jonathan, and part of the Westmoreland uh, Green Party that went down there with campaigning. So that was that was very pleasing for me on a personal level. Absolutely. But, yeah. Well, congratulations to you and all your colleagues on that one because it was a bit of a milestone. But um, just thinking about the Green Party, I mean, they polled four times the number of votes as they did in the last election, and I think they're now the biggest Green Party in Europe. But, but do you think electoral reform? would make a huge difference in, in getting a lot more people to, to get involved in, you know, in such type of parties. I think if you just step back and look at it dispassionately, I think it's amazing how much the Green Party has achieved without electoral reform. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you really look at the barriers that our electoral system imposes on a small party like the Green Party, you look at the the attempts that are made to keep it out of the media, all this kind of stuff. I think it's absolutely remarkable that the Green Party has uh, been able to achieve this level of visibility and bring real fresh new ideas to bear on a somewhat tired political debate. So electoral reform would be phenomenal. I mean, it would just change the story altogether. And I, obviously the Green Party needs to continue to campaign for all of that. But my sense is it shouldn't pin all its hopes on electoral reform. There's a mood out there, there's a kind of different narrative emerging, which is that we need politicians who do things differently. People just, they look at someone like Caroline Lucas and they say, yes, that's the kind of politician we want. We really want people who tell it as it is, are upfront about this stuff, they commit to things because of their values and their beliefs, they're passionate about what they do, they explain things in ways that we can actually um, understand. And you know, for me, it's massively heartening to see how people have responded to that, even though out of those one million voters, the vast majority will have known they weren't going to turn into an MP at the end of the day. Yeah. But that wasn't why they cast their vote for the Green Party. Yeah, well, that, that was certainly the case with, with me. OK, just coming to the last couple of questions, Jonathan. Um, what is your understanding of the, the middle way, if any? And if, if you do have an understanding, how, how does that relate to what we've been talking about today? And I mean, middle way is a kind of a phrase that resonates both with um, people who might have a spiritual approach to it or a political approach. In which particular instance are you talking about there, Barry? What's the... well, 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 from our perspective, we see it as a universal principle in the society. Yeah. It's, it's the idea that by avoiding fixed beliefs about things, by dogmatic, narrow-minded yeah. beliefs, that then you can make better judgments. So it's a principle of judgment, really. Yeah. No, and I think it's, it is hugely important. I, I've always been a little bit nervous about the middle way when it's construed as um, simply sitting somewhat forlornly in the middle of lots of other people's polarities. Yeah. Um, I felt a bit sorry for Nick Clegg in the final stage of the campaign where he tried to say that the principal reason for the Lib Dems existing was to um, mitigate the worst offences of either the Labour Party or the Tory Party, whichever ended up with the most votes. And I think people thought, well, if that's the middle way, we don't really want that. And I know that's not what you're talking about. It's, um, it's about finding a different route to interpreting our own responsibilities in, in our own lives, how we live our lives more responsibly and thoughtfully. It's about how we work with other people to bring about change. It's this whole notion about thoughtfulness in everything that we do. 
And in that respect, it is critical and actually very much a part of the educational thing that we were talking about um, before, not just for young people, but for um, adults at every stage of their life. That, that's great. And what is your greatest hope for the book, Jonathan? What I, what has really excited me personally is that people have seized on the book as a, as a message of hope because we know we've got to make these changes, but if the changes aren't also attractive, fun, aspirational, then it's very hard for people to, to commit to a process of what will be quite radical change. Let's be honest, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting journey to say the least. And they've taken out of the book a message of hope that this is not only doable, which is the first thing you have to be able to, to come to understand, but secondly, that in the doing of it, our lives will just be better. We will have better relationships with each other, with the rest of the human family, with life on Earth. We'll find different ways of expressing our own uh, potential, of looking after young people and the less well-off in society. It'll be a kinder, more compassionate, fairer society. And I just love the way people have seized on that and said, well, those aren't very complicated political ideas, but they certainly matter to the way we see the future. And that gives us hope. And that's the thing I'd most hope the book would do. Yeah, well, that's what, certainly what I got out of it, Jonathan. And I, I, you know, I recommend the book highly to anyone out there. And my, my last question, if people wanted to find out more about your work, how would they go about it? Um, well, I do have my own website where um, I do all my kind of political uh, blogging and stuff like that. I mean, my main working life is with Forum for the Future, the organization that um, I co-founded uh, back in 1996, and that's, the, that's still my main working occupation, as it were, trying to get big companies and other organizations to get more intelligent and purposeful about sustainability. But obviously, I've got a strong interest in politics and the Green Party and big issues like uh, nuclear power and so on. Um, and that's all on my blog, which is just um, www.jonathanporritt.org. Okay, well, it's it's been really great talking to you today, Jonathan. Thank you very much for giving up your time to speak to me. Not at all. My pleasure. You can find out more about Middleway Philosophy at www.middlewaysociety.org. Dot org.